Whiskey Jason here, whiskey from the viewpoint of an American in Germany tasting rare and exotic whiskeys. Today I'm in Japan. Now, Japanese whiskey is a little bit confusing. Yes, we have practiced an um, Nika on Santori, but now we also have a company called Mars. And Mars has two distilleries at the moment. So let's pull out the bottle here. You can actually read Mars here. Mars. And this uh, distillery is actually called... Uh, sorry for my pronunciation, of course. Tsunuki. Or Tsunuki. Let's call it Tsunuki. And uh, Mars actually belongs to a parent company called um, Humbo Shuzo. Also, my Japanese is not great. I'm so sorry. So, um, so we have Humbo Shuzo, and we have Mars, and Mars has actually then two different distilleries. One is the Shinshu Distillery, that was actually um, founded 1985. It was closed seven years later, 1992. It was mothballed until 2011, where it now was reopened and is also now still producing up until today. And the second uh, distillery that we have here, um, Sunuki was actually um, commissioned and went into operation on the 10th of November 2016. So the master distiller at uh, Sunuki actually learned at the parent company um, Shinshisu and he learned all his tricks and trades there. So what we have here is a second fill bourbon barrel. Okay, no problem. So what we have here is 61%. Mm, wow, that's not bad. And what we have here is basically a three-year-old whiskey for 199 euros. Now, not only you, but also many and many of my um, people who actually usually buy sh um, samples from me from my bottle share also went, are you crazy? No, no. 199 just absolutely blows the limit. Three-year-old, no thank you, I pass. So, yay. Hmm. So, um... The distillery has a capacity of about 100,000 liters in a year. The mother or the sister distillery, uh, Shinshu, also has about 100,000. They have a, um, here at um, Shunuki, uh, they have a 5,800 liter uh, wash still that they clean after every run. And they have a 3,300 liter a, a spirit still that they do not clean after every run because they want to have a more robust type of flavor. They do have warm tubs. And from each and every mash, um, they actually receive about 500 liters of spirit. So you start off with 5,800. Well, it's not all the way full. And then afterwards, you have from 5,000, you have 500. 500 that you can put into the, into the casks here. So um, if you fill up, for example, a sherry butt with 500 liters, hmm, that's like one run for one sherry butt, basically. You have to reduce it a little bit. But still, that's not a lot of spirit that's actually being produced. They do use different types of um, yeast strains, and often they combine them. They usually have a distiller's yeast plus maybe a White's Weizen beer yeast. Um, they maybe have a distiller's yeast and a Shinshu um, stout um, yeast. And what was also very interesting, there's an article on Whiskey Magazine, I think it's .com, where the guy, the author, actually went, visited the distillery, uh, went around with the master distiller and got the behind-the-scenes tour, and he actually found out that they take about a bucket of the uh, mash, the wort from before, and put it into the, the new one. So this is the sour mash technique that we have of bourbon is used here as well. This is the second um, release, at least for us in Europe. There was the first... Um, which I had bought and which I, I sold on online at auction for a little bit of a profit, not as much as I wanted. And this one I thought I'd actually then here share with my fans and they just basically said too expensive. Now I'm getting a nice sweet moment. I'm actually getting a little bit like a, a candied um, chocolate covered cherry moment. But I'm also getting a little bit of this cheesy type of um, light smokiness. If there's not enough smoke, if there's not enough peat, it can almost go into those old sock smell, that cheesiness moment, and that's what I'm getting here, unfortunately. I know that they um, at um, Sunuki use four different types of uh, barley. They have a heavily peated, which is like 60 ppm, 
They have a peated, which is like, um, I think, 30. They have a lightly peated, which was 15. And they have a not peated version, if I remember correctly. So um, they do have a third place where they can actually um, store. They have a warehouse in Yak Ku. China, where it's actually in this um, national park with a lot of cedar trees. And there they actually have about 8% angel share. Here at the um, Sunuki, they have about 6 And at the parent company in uh, Shishu, they have about 3% angel share. 61%? I don't really get this. I don't get the 61%. It doesn't seem that hot, to be honest. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow. It's a little too hot for me to actually um, describe it. I'm sorry. I get alcohol. I get hot. I get heat. I get wow. Um, not my whoa, wow. Light, light, light bitterness as well. <sighs> what was really, really weird, if you look at the bottle, it says here, um, Sunuki. Cast number 5108, exclusively bottled for Kirsch, import to Germany. This is product to Japan, imported by Le Maison de Whisky in Paris, in Paris. I'm sorry, not Paris, in Clichy, uh, Clichy uh, France. Um, so the people in Germany, um, the importers for Germany have to go to France and say, could you please import me a, a, a whole barrel just so I can do it for my um, customers in Germany? Wow, sorry, Kirsch. Um, the importing rights of Japanese whiskies, um, Japanese whiskies almost always, at least in Europe, are in with La Maison de Whisky. They actually have almost like a clamp, like a stronghold on the um, the rights to import something into Europe. So I think Nika, at least, and I'm almost sure Centauri as well, use La Maison de Whisky. All right, so on the nose. I took it down to about 45%. It gets a little bit better. I still have, I don't have the harmony. I don't have that, um, that wonderful cohesiveness here of a whiskey. I am getting a lot of that weak port, port, weak um, smoke, peat smell. That ruins it a little bit for me. It could be either very, a little bit stronger Strongly heavy, uh, heavily peated, or it could just not me at all. But in between, uh... mm. Mm -hmm. bringing it down to about forty-five, forty-eight percent. This is not bad. If you get the sweet spot here, this is actually nice. Unfortunately, they bottled it at 61%, which I don't like. See, I would have done something like this. Now, I'm a whiskey um, drinker, and I'm not a whiskey seller. All right? So I don't want to... I'm not trying to maximize my profits. I would have put this at 46%. I would have put it at 0 0.7 liters. And I would have maybe priced it at, I don't know, 79 euros. I said, go for it, guys. And then I'm sure this bottle would have been, you would have maybe about 50% more bottles because of 61 versus 46% ABV. You add a lot more water, you get a lot more bottles out of it. But I'm sure they would have sold a lot better at 79 euros. There's this threshold. The first threshold is basically where you go anything over 20, then 30, and then 40, and then 50, and then 60, and then 80, and then 100, and then 150, and then 200. And this is basically that threshold where you go, hey, it's a 200 euro bottle. Am I going to open it up? No. Am I going to drink this because I know it's a three-year-old Japanese whiskey? No. And so this becomes a collector item. Do we really want to have more collector's items here in um, Europe from Japan? No. At least not I don't as a drinker. I want people to open my whiskey up. I want them to drink it. I want them to enjoy it. I want them to have a good time with it. I want them to share and make good memories with friends. And that's what this whiskey could have been and should have been about. Unfortunately, it's not. It's a ornament. It's a souvenir. It's a 199 euro bottle that most people will never open up and never try. What a shame. What a shame.
So the question of the day is, what other ornament bottles do you have out there? I know that Artbeg 25 was just released, at least in Germany here. Um, the, the price was 750 euros was the um, recommended retail price. I saw them online immediately for 1300 euros, which was like, kick me in the butt and stomp on my head. Um, that's just way too high. So that's going to be also an ornament, those Artbeg 25s. What other ornaments are there out there, unfortunately? Now, I could compare this. I'm going to do this very, very briefly because that's what people like to do at my channel is to watch the comparisons. I have Nika Days. I don't think it was actually made in the States. If it did, excuse me. I'm happy that it was. or I'm, not, I'm sorry that it hasn't. Look at this bottle. This is a bartender's joy. It looks like something gin would come in, doesn't it? That bright, bright, bright yellow colors here. Now this is basically a very young Japanese grain whiskey with a little bit of malt thrown in there so they can call it a blend. And Happy Days is a very fresh, it's a very young, some type of a smooth and delicate blended whiskey with 40% from Nika. Now I'm just going to try this after having this in my glass. This was, as I said, at like 46%. There was a sweetness, there was a fruitiness, there was a lot of malt grain forwardness. It wasn't a bad whiskey. Um, for 69, even 79 euros, I would have went, mm, okay, well, yeah, but. But at 199 euros, I go, why did I buy it? Or why did I open it? So this Nika is less than 40 euros over here. Mm. This is something you can drink if you want to. It's a little bit hot. It's something you can mix with as well. Now, one thing I'd like to mention, if I can, in the next one and a half minutes is 1992, the mother company, the parent company of Ma, shut down Shin, Shinshu, the distillery. Why? Because of the whiskey glut. There was a loch. There was too much of it. And this is really the problem that we had. Um, just like in the 80s, we had with the bourbon, too much of the whiskeys up until the 90s. Um, the same thing happened in Japan, and so they weren't actually producing. Now, if you're going to be a good producer, you're going to do this. When the, when the whiskey boom goes on, and we're now here, I think, at least in this, the whiskey worldwide industry, and you're, if you're starting your whiskey um, company here, you're going to have a bust period, and it's going to go down, and this is going to be a problem. So we're going to lose some money. Now, if you start restart your company here and you can actually catch that wave going up, you're going to make a lot, a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, people in Japan didn't catch that wave. They, the wave was all the way up here and then it was like, oh, we need to do something. <laughs> and it's like, wait, wait, wait. Oh. And so they're always, you have to be a little bit anti-cyclic um, to do this correctly. And that's something that we're going to have to look out for and see what's going to happen in the world of whiskeys in the next couple of decades. Thank you very much for watching. Um, thank you very much for commenting. Thank you very much for being part of this whiskey community. Whiskey Jason here. Whiskey from the viewpoint of an American in Germany tasting rare and exotic whiskeys. A single cask, 5108 here from Japan, just for Germany, through the Le Maison de Whisky in France. Crazy, crazy whiskey world we live in. All the best. Bye-bye.